Hello, my name is Dr. Nikola Milosevic and welcome to the course Learn About Artificial Intelligence or AI as it is known shortly. In this introductory video, I would like to set expectation and let you know what we will cover in this short course. Uh, so, first of all, this course is for real beginners who want to learn what uh, AI is and how it will impact our society. We will therefore define what is the artificial intelligence, what are the types of artificial intelligence that you will be able to find around, and we will mention some significant successes and applications uh, that uh, had significant impact on either science or industry or our daily life. We will review and look into some of those uh, much deeper. Also, we will discuss how AI has changed the industry. So like AI or artificial intelligence is one of the main drivers of new industrial revolution and therefore changes how we do things as well uh, as it significantly changes the workplace. Many roles will soon be automated and done by the machine, while as in previous uh, industrial revolution, and new roles and jobs will appear. Therefore, this is aimed on preparing you uh, for what is coming and allow you to prepare better for the future, as well as your dear ones, for like, for example, your kids. You may want to steer them to a certain direction if they are studying or in school. Also, this course will not include any technical details. We will not go uh, deep into algorithms and how they operate. That we will cover in some more advanced course. So I hope you will enjoy this course and I'm looking forward to teach you uh, in this course. Thank you and stay tuned. Bye. Hello, my name is Nikola Milosevic and in this video we will have a look about some of the uh, reasons why would you like to learn about artificial intelligence or AI. So probably you have already your own reasons, however we can reinforce them with some of the new reasons or some of the more most common reasons. So let's have a look of what's going on. So in the world now AI is powering a lot of stuff. So pretty much everybody on their phone have either Google Assistant or uh, Siri or some other form of uh, personal assistance. Uh, on the other hand as well there are personal assistants that uh, come with Amazon uh, speakers or Google speakers or some other companies are producing speakers with uh, personal assistants. And as well, there is this like concept of Internet of Things, where a lot of devices like uh, TVs, wash machines, coffee makers, microwave, or uh, fridges would have integrated AI in, into them, and they would, uh, and as well a bunch of sensors, and they would collect the data about uh, your habits, and for example. Uh, your fridge would be able to realize that you are missing some ingredient that usually you would buy, for example milk, and it will order the new package of milk to be delivered to you. Uh, this can be as well like uh, in uh, kind of collaboration between devices, so maybe your watch would uh, be able to say that uh, you did too much workout and therefore you need a uh, certain type of food and for that food you may need uh, certain ingredients that needs to be uh, delivered to you. Uh, so uh, the life is supposed to get easier for people and a lot of those devices are uh, being empowered with artificial intelligence and therefore a lot of uh, traditional jobs that may be like producing a television or creating a wash machine or coffee making uh, would not uh, require AI engineers. Now actually AI engineers would be involved in the process and building uh, those artificial intelligence uh, into those devices. On the other hand, there is this like big buzzword uh, that almost become synonymous with AI, which is machine learning. You probably heard about this uh, 
buzzword. And machine learning is basically a subfield of artificial intelligence. In the next video, we will look at what are all the subfields of artificial intelligence. However, there were many breakthroughs uh, in recent couple of years due to machine learning. Uh, so one of the most significant one was that uh, Google, which is a uh, subsidiary or, or the company that they actually bought, which is called DeepMind, uh, challenged the world champion in Go. And Go is a pretty difficult game. There is, it's not possible to brute force it, and uh, quite a lot of professional players have a great intuition about game, and the game is played by... Uh, basic intuition. So uh, they challenged the world champion, Lee Sidol, uh, and they won four to one game uh, against him. So this is kind of a big breakthrough, and it, it was like due to machine learning and reinforcement machine learning, uh, which people are. Uh, speculating that it will have uh, quite a big impact on the future couple of years uh, and uh, reinforcement deep, deep learning will find a lot of application in the future uh, future things from medicine to uh, some other fields. Uh, on the other hand, there is automated and connected vehicles. Again, again this is uh, sort of uh, falls into field of Internet of Things. Uh, so those cars would be connected to the Internet. They would be able to download the latest upgrades and stuff like that. Uh, and they would have a bunch of sensors like uh, LiDAR and radars and cameras which would uh, basically take pictures of the road and based on those uh, pictures or videos of the road uh, they would be able to drive as a human does so there wouldn't be a necessity of any kind of like trucks like you have for trains or uh, or trams and those cars and vehicles would be able to move so like uh, a lot of cars like tesla has some of the automated driving google is working on it uh, toyota is working on it so some of the german uh, car manufacturers are working on it uh, so and that is quite a big deal that uh, basically you can do uh, similar action as human would with his sight and hearing and motoric abilities uh, via AI. Uh, so a lot of uh, things that we today do by people uh, in relatively near fu future will be uh, automated and it would be possible to do by artificial intelligence. Uh, so artificial intelligence now goes into almost every aspect of life. So you have uh, application in language and language understanding, such as chatbot, conversational agents, virtual assistants, speaking robots. Uh, so you can see those already with your mobile phones, like pretty much everybody uh, had uh, some conversation with conversational agents and chatbots. A lot of websites uh, use chatbots, so a lot of time you wouldn't be actually talking to the human, but you would be talking to a chatbot. Uh, security, like a lot of application in detecting of uh, who is breaching certain perimeters, uh, whether somebody is uh, breaching the perimeter is done by the cameras that have some motion detection and person detection in it. Malware intrusion detection is uh, quite often done with some of uh, artificial intelligence. So not only the malicious programs that have already been analyzed and have signature would be uh, preventing from entering the system, but as well uh, similar uh, similar programs or programs that have any kind of malicious behavior uh, would be detected and, uh, and banned from executing on the system. As well, like threat intelligence, so like finding out uh, who is uh, potential 
threat for your either business or uh, or your you as a person would be done quite often by collecting the information on the internet, uh, aggregating them and analyzing them. Incident response would be as well done uh, uh, sometimes with uh, artificial intelligence. So like if something bad happened, like some malware or breach, artificial intelligence would be able to uh, make a responses that would prevent uh, further breach. Uh, as well, there are uh, automated vehicles. You have a lot of uh, new applications in games, especially like we mentioned AlphaGo. So you will have as well uh, a movie. Uh, I will link it uh, to the YouTube where you can watch the whole documentary about AlphaGo, so you know what it's about and uh, how it all worked and what impact it has on society and on. Uh, general thinking but as well like uh, Google DeepMind did Alpha Star which was able to play video games against professional players especially Alpha Star was play playing StarCraft so even the modern games uh, were being played by machine and reading against professional players and as well there are there were before Atari games and stuff like that uh, other kind of thing is Internet of Things and smart cities so a lot of cities are now uh, trying to uh, go towards the concept of the smart city where uh, they connect buildings and uh, certain sensors and cameras and pretty much everything that the government installs in the city uh, to both collect data and be able uh, to uh, give to the city officials and uh, people working for, for the city services some insight about uh, how to react and how to improve the system of public transport or transport in general or how to reduce the crime and so on and so forth. So generally why would you learn uh, AI is that as well there is a lot of talent needed in all the fields from uh, technical and engineering fields to uh, fields that are more related about ethics and uh, s s stuff like how to prevent uh, AI from uh, having uh, taking over and uh, having a bad impact to the society, how, how the job market will change, so like even HR will, will be affected and so on. So pretty much everybody in today's world will be uh, needed to know something about artificial intelligence. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you and you can see in further video what are the kinds of AI and what is actually the definition of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Hello, my name is Nikola Milosic and today we will review a bit of history of AI. So what was happening until now and when it was all invented. So for a start, let's start with uh, how did it all start it so so like think about when people started imagining about automated uh, machines uh, that can do intelligent things so usually in the past uh, people were fascinated by human nature and like how humans uh, were working so they tended to make all these automated machines human like so anthropomorphize uh, all these machines and one of the first was the myths of Talos which was from Crete in from 400 BC however this was a myth so this was like completely uh, imagined uh, automata and uh, Talos according to the myth was circling around the Crete uh, protecting Europa against pirates uh, then, as well, a bit older than that was King Mu of Zhao uh, in China in 900 BC. Uh, so the story says that uh, there was a certain person, certain engineer or artifactor, who created a machine that was human-like and that could sing and move around. 
uh, and uh, the, the king was uh, even afraid, so he basically ordered to destroy and disassemble the the whole automata. Uh, the next meet was Golem, which was from Prague in the uh, 1580s, and the story goes that basically some rabbi uh, from the Jewish uh, quarter built uh, golem and gave him a life and therefore uh, he was protecting uh, the Jewish quarter uh, against invaders. Uh, however, the origin of the word robot is as well Czech and it comes from uh, Karel Czapek and his, uh, uh, his play that he wrote in early 20s, I think. Uh, and uh, basically robot means uh, like person that does some work in Czech language uh, or, or it's derived from that. Uh, however, if we go really to like how it all started, it all started with the invention of computer and it uh, origins of computers can be traced to Alan Turing uh, who basically presented a uh, universal machine in uh, uh, 1936 uh, and uh, this machine uh, was a he basically was able to prove that using only two symbols uh, one is able to uh, basically do all the calculation and all the computation. So this is called Turing Universal Machine and machines that have this capability are Turing complete. Then in the 1940s uh, appeared the new like first computers and basically late 30s so like beginning of the Second World War they were used mainly uh, for cryptography, for messaging, for decrypting the messages, and as well for calculating the, um, like how the rockets or torpedoes would uh, go. Uh, so, so basically, the trajectories of the projectiles, either from art artillery or the rockets or the uh, the torpedoes. However, the origins of artificial intelligence can be traced to Dark Midsummer research project on artificial intelligence that happened after the Second World War. So in 1956, uh, Marvin Minsky and a couple of other uh, researchers uh, gathered in one location in Dartmouth, and they basically started discussing about artificial intelligence, how it can be done, what are certain things that uh, can be done by uh, with artificial intelligence. And there were some initial early successes. So one of them that can be traced to that period is Eliza Bot, uh, which is a psychotherapist bot that is able to recognize certain words uh, in what a person writes and then uh, uh, writes back uh, certain questions that uh, usual psychotherapists would ask you. Uh, and that was like pretty impressive, uh, especially since it could hold a conversation almost unrecognizably, whether it's human or not, for a certain amount of time. Uh, as well, at the same period, semantic networks were created. Uh, so basically, that are the networks where uh, you can do some reasoning uh, again around them so like you can say that uh, bear and, uh, and wheel are similar because they are mammals and then bear is animal even though that there is no di direct connection between uh, bear and animal but there is in indirect connection. Now what happened then is that Alpha report was published in 1966 and it started triggering uh, withdrawal of funding for AI research. Uh, so Alpha report uh, 
mainly was considered in language and advances in language and in uh, machine translation. Uh, this was kind of important for DARPA at the time because uh, they wanted to translate Russian messages. Uh, however, uh, the power of uh, machine translation at the time was not really uh, good or at the level that it could be usable, so the report stated that uh, capabilities that were promised in uh, a Bermud conference could, could not be satisfied. Uh, and then in 1973, uh, what happened and what even more uh, put nailed to the box was Long Hill report in UK and that as well stated uh, that AI could not deliver the promises that it made some 15 years ago and that there is combinatorial explosion that the machines and uh, computers at the time that the AI is supposed to operate could not cope with computation that and computers that underlies them and that that should uh, be executed or calculated at a time. Uh, so this really kind of like stopped the AI research and stopped the funding and this is really the trigger of true AI winter. Uh, so we have here some timeline. Uh, so we have from Dharmut Conference in 1956 to 1974, first wave of excitement about AI. Uh, US Defense Agency, DARPA is funding a lot of AI projects. Uh, and then in 1974 until 1980, there is a limited number of researches going into AI because uh, it's generally understood that AI cannot deliver the promises that it made. Then in the 80s, uh, there was a renewed excitement and especially it came with expert systems, so the system that uh, somebody will, some expert would program uh, his, his or her knowledge into the system and therefore system could answer some quite complex specific uh, problems as the expert uh, would be asked. Uh, now that lasted for less than 10 years and then happened second AI winter. So uh, it was found out that there was a limitation of if then reasoning and uh, uh, most of those uh, computer, uh, most of those AI were developed in list, on list machines and list market basically at that point crashed and as well like DARPA lost excitement about AI. And from 1994 to the present, we have a slow and steady progress of artificial intelligence, and especially since uh, 2010, there was a deep learning which brought a new wave of uh, really huge excitement about artificial intelligence and machine learning especially. Uh, so here we have another timeline, so 50s until uh, like 73, 74, we have symbolic, uh, like era of symbolic reasoning. Uh, then in the early, late 70s and, uh, uh, and early 80s, we have AI winter, then we have expert systems, again, second AI winter, and then we have uh, intelligent agents until 2000s, uh, early 2000s, and then uh, statistical uh, artificial intelligence. So like from 2012, we have this uh, really deep learning revolution that is going on. Uh, and yeah, as well, important to mention is Turing test, which uh, basically, uh, made a test for conversational AI that uh, that works in a fashion that human has to uh, chat with two agents. One is human, one is non-human, and if a person is unable to recognize which is which, uh, then the AI is passing the Turing test. Uh, 
However, if person is able to recognize which is machine, then uh, the test. Uh, so now we are living in deep learning revolution and it uh, touches a number of aspects of life. So from image recognition, we have camera self-driving cars that are uh, powered by image recognition. Natural language processing uh, is really kind of on a big rise. So we have search engines, we have uh, assistants such as Alexa or Google Home, or even every phone has something like Siri or Google Assistant or something similar. Uh, there, there was a lot of uh, research and AI use of portfolio management and predictions for stock market uh, price movements. Uh, in medicines, there is huge push to uh, use AI to reduce the cost of drug discovery or better do diagnostics of diseases. And as well, there is speech recognition. So like you have these like, devices like Alexa and uh, Google Home uh, and Siri that uh, work on speech recognition and then natural language processing. And we have as well robotics and self-driving cars. A uh, couple of things that, uh, uh, that we can have a look at is, as a successes of AI is AlphaGo and uh, uh, Star Alpha, which basically play games on a level better than the professional humans and Pepper Robots, which is able to do a number of stuff that, uh, that mimic human and can be like programmed uh, to act quite intelligently and use in healthcare. Uh, and as well, currently we are uh, going through Industrial Revolution 4. So first Industrial Revolution happened in the uh, 1780s. So that was like first uh, mechanization, steam power, waving loom, and stuff like that. We had second Industrial Revolution in 1870s. So uh, that was introduction of mass production, assembly lines, electrical energy. Uh, and then in the 70s, we have third industrial revolution, which uh, brought some uh, automated assembly lines, computers and electronics to everyday life. And currently we are living in uh, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which means we are introduced with cyber physical system, internet of things, networks and artificial intelligence uh, that drive society further. So that's everything I have for now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and... Hello, this is Nikola Milosevic and in this lecture we will talk about types of the AI. So like what are the kinds and types of AI that either through history or at the moment exist. So we have this uh, nice graph that uh, tells us how artificial intelligence resembles uh, all the human senses. Uh, but let's first define what actually AI is and what are the definitions. So uh, the most simple definition is that artificial intelligence is intelligence presented by a machine. <clears throat> And basically it can be a flexible agent that interacts uh, with the environment and performs actions to maximize success towards a certain goal. So these goals can be human capabilities uh, and we have some capabilities like seeing, hearing, talking, singing, uh, understanding the language, movement, reasoning and learning. Uh, and for each of those capabilities, there is a field of research in artificial intelligence, or at least th there was. But, but most of them still are active and still are existing. For example, for seeing, we have a computer vision, and that was a, a especially kind of important field in the past, and a lot of advances that came uh, for other areas were first implemented in uh, computer vision. Then we have like sound, uh, hearing and sound processing is a research field in artificial intelligence. As well, talking, singing is sound uh, synthesis. 
uh, understanding the language. That is how we manage to communicate. There is a natural language processing that is especially prominent at the moment. So at the moment, natural language processing is really a kind of big field and a lot of advances uh, it had in the uh, past couple of years. Then robotic is for mainly movement, uh, but as well like for sensing environment and mapping like how to move in this environment. Uh, reasoning so like we <clears throat> can think we can reason so that's automated reasoning automated reasoning is mainly logic based uh, and then we have a uh, learning and here we have like machine learning that is as well like uh, one big field and one really prominent uh, today and a lot of uh, advances in artificial intelligence are connected to uh, machine learning uh, so a lot of advances that came uh, in computer vision or natural language processing or robotics in recent years came through machine learning it was application of machine learning on this field so like machine learning as on itself it just like tries to uh, find out how people learn and how a machine can learn to do better stuff based on the data, based on the observing the environment uh, and, and things like that. Uh, however, if you really want some application, you need to learn something practical, so like something like language or uh, how to distinguish objects in a picture or uh, how to distinguish words in a stream of the uh, of the sound and stuff like that uh, so that's why we will here focus a bit on machine learning as it is one of the uh, areas that underlies or that is a fun founding stone of a lot of artificial intelligence application so let's define uh, what machine learning is so it is a subfield of computer science that explores uh, how machine can learn to perform certain tasks without explicit program so this is important like you can program through some logic and rules uh, artificial intelligence in a way that it uh, looks that it's performing intelligent tasks however machine learning is uh, basically trying to program algorithms that if you feed them any type of data uh, they will be able to uh, learn to perform a certain task uh, without explicitly programming it for that particular task uh, so usually what you have in machine learning is that you will supply some data that is either annotated or not annotated or some environment where the agent can uh, uh, roam around uh, and based on that data uh, or environment uh, the algorithm will create a model and that model can be used with the new data to predict uh, the actions or the labels of the data or something like that. We will go deeper into kinds of uh, machine learning and the tasks of machine learning and how they can be applied in other areas, especially in uh, language processing and vision and some data processing. So let's see what are kind of like kinds of machine learning. And uh, usually it's uh, three kinds of uh, machine learning however we can have as well like semi-supervised learning as a fourth kind uh, but you, you will see it is basically a mixture of supervised and unsupervised learning so the main kind are supervised unsupervised and reinforcement learning uh, so supervised learning is when you are teaching the machine, when you are supplying it with the data and you are telling it what you want as an output. So it's task driven, is like predict the next value if I have uh, certain values in a, in a some like time frame or uh, classified text whether it's positive or negative so something like sentiment analysis or detect uh, cats on the picture or cars on the picture or stuff like that uh, so 
but uh, what is important is that you need to supply it with data, data that has a label. So you need to show the machine uh, what you want it to uh, output at the end. Unsupervised is completely different, completely opposite of the supervised. So you're basically just giving it the data and uh, try to let machine figure out uh, whether there are any patterns in the data. Uh, and uh, here the main uh, task is basically clustering. So uh, try to find out the clusters of data uh, that are appearing there. And the third kind is reinforcement learning and uh, it is basically learning from mistakes. So you're usually having an agent that doesn't know what to do. So you put it in a game, for example, and it at the beginning randomly clicks the commands. And over time he learns uh, or it learns uh, based on some reward system uh, that certain commands or certain sequence of the commands are quite beneficial for it, for it. Uh, and therefore it learns slowly to um, by replaying the game again and again it learns to play the game and as well this can be applied for for example um, robotics where a robot will learn how to move around the room or automated cars where the cars would learn how to drive slowly and stuff like that so basically you will have a system of rewards and punishment the agent will try things out at the beginning and then based on the punishment and learning uh, punishment and uh, rewards it will it will um, figure out how to solve the task and a lot of advances in the latest couple of years have been through reinforcement learning so AlphaGo and uh, Star Alpha uh, were based on reinforcement learning. Uh, Semi-supervised learning is when you don't have enough data uh, to produce supervised learning. So usually supervised learning is quite good when you know what you want as, a, as an output. Uh, but if you don't have enough data, you can uh, use some data that you have uh, and then try to make a model out of it, uh, apply it on the, the rest of the data that you have that, that is not labeled, label it and then use it as a full data set and try to like improve then make kind of like supervised learning even though you most of your data is kind of like unsupervised and you can use as well like some tricks and combination of like supervised and unsupervised algorithm to improve it uh, but generally it is like you want to solve supervised tasks, but you, most of the data that you have are kind of like un, unsupervised. And then like, if we want to make a project uh, on artificial intelligence, uh, what we need to do is kind of like flow like this. So like first you need to define and refine the business problem that you want to solve and that you're uh, having. Uh, then you need to prepare the data so like you need to ingest the data to label if it you want to uh, create supervised learning uh, just collect the data if it's unsupervised learning or kind of like build some kind of uh, virtual environment uh, with built-in uh, uh, reward system uh, and then you need to do a bit of uh, data cleaning and data transformation. And it is said that like about 80% of the time data scientists spend is through data cleaning and transformation and only like 20% is actual work on building uh, machine learning and AI models. Uh, so this takes a lot of time to get cleanest data possible and transform to the right format that is easily in ingested into a machine learning algorithm that can be then uh, utilized. Uh, 
now uh, now then the next task is uh, you need to select the feature so like the things uh, that need to go from the data into a machine learning algorithm uh, from which the model will be built so sometimes you will have irrelevant data irrelevant data points that you can exclude and not enter the the machine learning model uh, in a deep learning, this may be sometimes a bit different that uh, you can skip that this step and uh, feature selection will be done internally through neural network, but we'll keep it here. And sometimes it's helpful to as well look at the feature selection uh, regardless of whether you're working on a deep learning or not deep learning approaches. Then you can uh, uh, create the machine learning model, you can test the model, uh, and then if you're happy, you can deploy it, or if you're not happy with the performance of the model, you can uh, do more data cleaning, transformation, feature selection, and kind of continue this uh, cycle until you're happy. And uh, once you deploy it, you can monitor model performance and then uh, see whether it solves your business problem that you uh, establish at the beginning. If not, you can refine it as well. If the testing goes wrong, you can as well go to the refining the business problem. Like maybe there went something wrong. Uh, so you are not really solving the right problem. Uh, uh, so as we talked about supervised learning is mainly kind of like classification you would give it the data with some shapes and colors and stuff like that and you want uh, for example a program to uh, classify whether it's a cupcake or apple uh, and uh, here, here basically you would have a classified data that will be used for learning. Uh, the machine model will, the machine learning model will be created that takes this data and takes these labels uh, and uh, creates a model that when unseen data like a new cupcake come, it can say that it has a class of cupcake. Uh, when it's unsupervised learning, you can have uh, this like number of unlabeled data with uh, cats and mouses with Tom and Jerry, but you don't know that it's Tom and Jerry. So you can uh, go through the process that we explain. So a bit of data cleaning, uh, some kind of like feature selection. Uh, you go to the algorithm and you uh, create a model and the model will be able to group all the mouses in one cluster and all the cats uh, in the other. So this is kind of like how this is kind of like algorithm is able to uh, distinguish uh, the shapes and the, and the data points without you explicitly telling it. Like it won't uh, say that this is a cat, but then by looking at a uh, couple of examples, you will be able to see what's the pattern that the algorithm uh, went by, and then you maybe would label the clusters. Reinforcement learning is as we explained, you have a game where, for example, this dinosaur is supposed to find a tree and uh, it can perform certain types of actions. Uh, initially, it would try random actions, but as it goes to uh, towards the tree, as uh, he would... Uh, get closer and closer he would get more and more rewards so over the time he would learn that he needs to reach the tree and uh, what is actually the best way the most optimal way to reach reach it and as well with any other games like Atari games or whatever this is like very useful approach to um, to, to learning so if you have these agents in certain environment reinforcement learning is one of your probably best bets and thank you uh, so this is it for this video and see you next time 
Hello, my name is Nikola Milosevic and in this video we will look into AI and machine learning tasks. Uh, so, one of the first tasks that we had and that we as well like talked a bit in a previous uh, lecture is classification. And a lot of things can be uh, modeled as a classification so for example here we have again like training data as apples and cupcakes that needs to be classified like what object is apple and what is a, cu a cupcake usually classification is a supervised learning task and uh, therefore we need some supervised data but classification can be uh, applied to many things like classifying whether a document is positive, negative, whether it is about a certain topic, uh, whether image contains certain object like a cat or a car or something like that. Uh, so that is classification. I hope that is relatively clear. Uh, here we have like one example of the classification so this is uh, sentiment analysis for uh, sms messages uh, so for example you have a stream of sms messages and then the classifier would score it whether it is positive uh, sms message uh, which language it is whether it's like neutral so like some messages can just don't have some written sentiment and some can be kind of like angry or negative uh, so yeah like this is one example and then like the second the second task we will talk about is uh, sequence modeling and sequence modeling can be applied in text because like text can be modeled as a sequence of words but as well it can be applied to like something like time series or something like that so pretty much any sequence and there are a bunch of algorithms uh, such as conditional random fields or recurrent neural networks that or hidden marco models that can uh, be applied to do sequence modeling so we have here a sentence that says you're an official Ux heads for Baghdad, uh, and uh, the sequence modeler will look at the words in a sequence and change state as it goes true, but as well it will predict for each word what is the class. So it is kind of like classification, but for sequences uh, where the context matters. So like if we have like normal classification, we put all the doc like all the document there, and we uh, expect one class. Here we expect a class for each word, but. Uh, it is different uh, uh, depending on the context. So here it's uh, pretty clear that United Nations is organization, official is other, so it's not really one of our classes. Elks is a person, heads for is again like nothing, and Baghdad is a location. Uh, however, uh, why context matter in the sequence modeling and how sequence modeling works is that if we have something like New York City and a person has seen the city, it would know that New York City is the actual geographic location uh, because of the context that the person went to New York City. Uh, while if person just uh, was sightseeing a city, it is n the context is different, and uh, there therefore the sequence would tell him that see the city in this context is not part of the geographical location. And we can have like different things like that where uh, organization names could be a common word, but because of the context of the text, it can be uh, it it will be classified as our organization or not. Uh, regression is one other task where we have certain data point and we want to build a model uh, which is basically a function of the data points it will uh, try to draw a line that or a function basically uh, which resembles the most uh, the data that we are that we have provided previously uh, so we can have something like percentage of fat compared to body mass index and uh, 
the, f the method is able to draw a line and then if we have a new data point that somebody has 30% uh, of uh, body fat, we can predict that their uh, body mass index is about like 22 to 23. Uh, and, and so on. So, so as well, like you can do do it with, for example, uh, apartment pri prices depending on the region or city in the city and stuff like that. So you can plot this line and therefore predict uh, what is the other uh, other variable if you have one of those. Uh, clustering is unsupervised uh, tasks, so you wouldn't have two objects, uh, but and it is supposed to base on the data that you just provide, uh, cluster objects based on the certain criteria. Uh, however, in this case, you're not really providing based on the which criteria you want it to be classified. You're just expecting the algorithm to find something really distinct about the objects uh, to classify them, to cluster them, basically. Uh, and uh, here is an example uh, which telling why it often is not a good solution or it doesn't provide you expected results. So if you have a Simpson characters, as here in the picture, uh, you can think about like what is the natural grouping of this character. Uh, so you can uh, group them by Simpson family and the others. Uh, you can uh, group them by males and uh, females. And as well, you can group them as a school employee or non-school employee uh, and so on and so forth. So there, there is like a number of ways that you can uh, cluster the objects. And sometimes you can provide some additional data and steer cluster, uh, clustering process. However, it is not always that straightforward. And quite often you rely on the algorithm and what the algorithm will pick. Uh, the next task that we have in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is anomaly detection. In this task, you have certain function that goes, for example, some time series uh, where you have energy consumption per hours and, or consecutive days. Uh, and if suddenly something spikes, uh, you can detect that it is not normal uh, flow of the function. Uh, so, so you can provide some uh, kind of like threshold where you would detect the anomaly. And this is uh, quite often used, for example, in uh, like financial fraud detection, so like credit cards when they are like they are like fraudulent transactions and stuff like that. They quite often uh, could be detected with anomaly detection. Anomaly detection is as well used for like malware analysis and uh, some some kind of like uh, dynamic analysis of your system. So like if suddenly a system starts operating. Uh, a bit weirdly, you can detect it, you can notify uh, people responsible for the system uh, so they can fix the system. Uh, it's used in a power plants and stuff like that. So, so when, wherever you have like time series, uh, it can be applied and there are like different cases when it's useful. So usually for preventing like anomalies usually are quite bad things. So uh, usually you want to uh, to detect them in order to, to, to stop and prevent further harm to the uh, system. Uh, then ranking. So we have something like Google that basically ranks the documents that it finds uh, based on the, their relevance. And there are like different ways how to use it. Uh, so Google ranks based on the uh, text that you search as well as the number of links that uh, leads to that text uh, and there are as well like other cases where you need to rank the results that you're getting from your query uh, whether by some kind of like relevance or some other criteria but as well it can be used as a task in artificial intelligence and as well in machine learning uh, so for example if you uh, have uh, 
different kind of homonyms, so like things that have a uh, same uh, same same shape of the word but a different meaning. You may want to, uh, based on the context, try to rank what is actually the meaning of the word. Uh, Recommendation is one other task that uh, machine learning can solve. So like we have example here of Amazon and the books that they recommend based on your previous purchases. Uh, and uh, it, it usually works in a way that uh, it looks on like what you previously purchased, what people uh, that uh, purchase same things or similar things uh, purchase additionally to you and then they, uh, then it recommends you uh, the things that they purchased or most they most commonly purchased uh, and you can see recommendation engines in quite a lot of uh, places so like Amazon is not only one you have like Netflix Disney plus all, all these uh, online platforms that are pretty much selling anything they will try to recommend the next things that you may want to buy as well. Agent movement, so uh, we mentioned in a previous uh, session, um, reinforcement learning, and as well, this is kind of like machine learning and artificial intelligence tasks that uh, this agent would uh, start initially moving and then uh, based on a certain reward and punishment mechanism, it would uh, try to avoid uh, certain uh, obstacles and as well maybe try to learn the map of the environment that he is operating in and therefore easily move between the rooms or around the, the environment that, that it has to move around and that's all so, so i think you are now able to think about uh, different tasks and uh, different applications that you could use those uh, kind of uh, machine learning mechanisms and machine learning tasks so uh, when would you use classification when would you use uh, clustering or sequence modeling and, or agent movement recommendation ranking and stuff like that so I hope you enjoyed the lessons and see you in the next one. Hello and welcome again to the new lecture. Today we will talk about how AI impacts jobs and automation and how the future will look like for us uh, in terms of the job market and economy, uh, finance and so on. So let's get started by having a look at the chart of how economy looked through the past. So basically earth was very poor, like people were living on very minimal uh, amount of money that they could make or the value that they could make. And that was happening through pretty much most of our history until the end of 19th century. And then, like at the end of 19th century, happened the Industrial Revolution. And uh, with this moment that we have in uh, 1870s, uh, we have a spiral growth of the uh, value that is created in the economy. And it's been a pretty skyrocketing. Uh, and we, we are now at the the year like 2020 and it's still like growing and we are maybe about like more than 60 uh, trillion uh, dollars uh, and, and it's growing more and more so, so like we are now at this moment richer than we ever were in the history and the creation of wealth is create uh, is created so rapidly and it's even increasing uh, more rapidly uh, so like how it all started was with the invention of steam engines and industrial revolution uh, which allowed uh, production of the clothes and uh, faster transportation uh, so, so like trains were invented and uh, as well there were like a lot of factories so this automated a lot of jobs that for example for certain uh, cloth to be made uh, it took 
one person for quite a long time for maybe a days uh, while uh, during the industrial revolution the machines were invented that could automate that and can make it very faster and can serialize that production uh, and this brought to do economic doctrines uh, which is communism and capitalism uh, one invented by Karl Mar Marx and Engels and the other by Adam Smith uh, and those two ideologies would fight throughout uh, pretty much whole of the 20th century uh, especially prominent the fight was during the Cold War uh, and this is basically a fight between redistributing the wealth and taking care of the society as such versus uh, looking at the things more individualistic and uh, not really redistributing as much as uh, the society may need or ba basically like uh, protecting the ones that are capitalists and industrialists uh, so they can keep the majority of the profit and not re redistribute it to that wealth. Um, it kind of like sounds uh, how I put it a bit wrong uh, as it kind of assumes that capitalism is bad but it's basically not it uh, like both of the system have uh, their advantages and disadvantages like socialism uh, is as well like by redistributing the wealth it uh, kind of reducing the uh, it, it reduces the need for innovation while capitalism is pushing the, the innovation because uh, every innovation will have uh, immediate benefits for the capitalist uh, so he would like finance a uh, new innovation and work on the new innovation. However, on the other hand, redistrib redistribution will uh, provide for the society like more uh, services like healthcare and protection if the people lose their jobs and, and certain other economic uh, hardship that uh, people can get into. Uh, so. As automation progresses, this is like one of the Einstein's quotes. He said he was seeing the automation coming and said that ultimate automation will make our modern industry as primitive and outdated as the Stone Age man uh, looked to us today. Uh, so basically, if you look at the technology that we have today and compare it to the age of industrial revolution, so like we have factories that are totally automated did and make cars with very little human interaction we have virtual reality mobile phones where you have access to internet or to pretty much um, any information or you can communicate uh, with anyone quite fast all around the world uh, we can put that technology even in the glass uh, there is a self-driving car uh, robots that are like personal assistants so if you compare this to the age of industrial revolution industrial revolution age looks pretty primitive to us today uh, and if you and the the pace of increasing the the technological advances is ever faster. So now, if we look in like fifty years from now and look back to today, probably we will look quite primitive to them, even more than industrial revolution looks to us today. So the the pace of innovation is faster. And we have as well like artificial intelligence playing uh, games and uh, winning like world champions. And this is kind of important because uh, you have this like field of study called game theory, which models all political or economic systems and uh, um, and actions as a game. Uh, so if we can master with AI playing a game, that can help us tremendously in uh, uh, making decisions in like helping us, uh, 
like AI can help us uh, make a good uh, decision in economical or political things. And as well, there's like AI uh, being able to uh, recognize what is in the picture and describe it in human language. Uh, uh, there is quite a lot that AI is doing in uh, drug discovery and medication uh, and healthcare industry uh, overall. So we had this uh, research field previously, and it's quite important to emphasize that for pretty much every capability that we have as humans, there is AI research field. So we are in parallel pushing pretty much all the um, all the senses and all the capabilities that human can do, so, so machines can do it better. Uh, like not maybe better than humans, but at least help us in certain tasks. However, there were some kind of like scary thoughts and it started quite long ago. So like with John Farrell Kennedy, uh, who saw that the revolution of automation finds machine replacing men in the mines and mills of America without replacing their incomes or uh, their training in their needs to pay the family doctor, grocery and landlord. So there is a bit of scare uh, going on in the world about uh, what will happen if this automation and AI uh, start reducing even more jobs. And especially now we are in the situation where AI uh, can uh, wipe out the jobs faster than any revolution before it uh, could. So what about the income of the people that had those jobs? Uh, and what about their training and how, how they will afford to be living? And then there are basically two th theories that how we can solve this, uh, this problem and how the future will look like. And we will talk a bit later about it. Uh, however, what we can see is that uh, the population on Earth is growing tremendously. Uh, so in 1900 we had about 1 billion people, now we have about 7 billion people. Uh, however, if you uh, look at the unemployment rates, it was quite stable, like never we had uh, too big unemployment. So there was like during the Great Depression and like maybe uh, beginning uh, of the Second World War. Uh, quite larger unemployment rates, but generally people had the jobs, even though uh, we have exponentially rising population. And as well, during this time, a bunch of revolution and a bunch of automation happened. So as well, it didn't really affect that much uh, job market. So jobs were there. However, uh, you can see that some jobs disappeared. So uh, in 1800s, you had uh, children or people working to uh, put the, uh, the bowling bowls uh, on a place. Now it's done by the machine. There were people that you could hire uh, to knock on your window to wake you up in the morning. Now it's done by a mobile phone, uh, has alarm and uh, you don't need a person to pay to wake you up. There were people who were cutting uh, ice in order to uh, basically provide ice. There, there were people uh, who were, were working like lighting up the, the street lights. Now it's all automatically. Uh, as well, there, there were people who were like telephone operators uh, with whom you will have contact and they will connect you with someone. Now you, you don't need uh, those people. And they, they were like, as you can see, uh, it is lots of people that did these jobs. Like on these pictures are some floors of some companies uh, that uh, did those things. And you see the, those jobs all vanish. You don't have them today. Uh, however, some of them appeared like software engineer. There, like there was no software in 1900s, therefore there was no need for software engineer. Now you have them. There was as well like lab technicians or like medical device technicians. 
uh, like once you didn't have those uh, big medical devices that needed a technician, uh, there was no need for them. Uh, social media managers, without social media, you don't need them. You, you can say that there were some kind of like spokespersons or, uh, or some like uh, PRs. However, now with increasing amount of s the social media, there's like more and more people like that. Uh, there was no planes, so there was no pilots and no uh, uh, crew in the airplanes. There was no car, no uh, auto mechanics, no camera, no cameramans. Uh, so all of these jobs appeared and that kind of like balanced out the, the jobs that vanished. Uh, and if we look at today there are as well like some jobs that may vanish and may disappear uh, so uh, for example you can have like accountants that uh, do like relatively simple accounting that may disappear some lawyers uh, or s some niches of like lawyer industry may be automated uh, drivers as there will be more and more self driving cars uh, cashiers you already have automated cashiers uh, and there is like less and less uh, uh, normal like human cashiers and as well like financial analysts so like a lot of uh, financial industry is like software based and computer based it's getting even more automated and now uh, algorithms start doing quite better job or quite good job that there is lower and lower amount of those financial analysts needed and as well like military there, there is a lot of drones and uh, kind of like automated tanks and uh, so the future of warfare may look quite different than it does today and we may be having countries fighting between each other by just fighting their machines um, however some jobs will uh, appear so there is this like article in the world uh, in the economies that appeared in 2017 where a person says that inspired by isaac asimov's classic robot series my 16 year old daughter wants to be a robot psychologist a troubleshooter who figures out why robots are misbehaving that the job doesn't exist complain her school career advisor true my daughter replied but it probably will in 2025 so there are a lot of jobs that may appear like drone traffic uh, optimizers, 3D uh, food printer chefs, uh, augmented reality architects, driverless ride experience designer, molecular gastronomist and, and stuff like that. So there will be jobs. There probably wouldn't be uh, like huge drop of unemployment. However, when we look at how the things will work out for us, uh, we have this two theory that I said before and it as well like comes to the fight between socialism and capitalism to a certain level and socialism and capitalist policies. Uh, so uh, Hawking said that everyone can enjoy a life of luxurious leisure if the machine produces well the share or most people can end up miserably poor if the machine owners successfully lobby against uh, wealth uh, redistribution. Uh, so far, the trend seems to be towards the second option, with technology driving ever-increasing inequality. So we have a risk of uh, ever-increasing inequality. However, there are some people coming with ideas like universal basic income uh, that uh, would redistribute the wealth and, to a certain level, uh, help uh, people whose job will be automated or whose job will not be needed at least at, like to the time that they can be retrained to gain some uh, other job uh, and yeah like we, we do have a problem that basically people who are in top 
industries, especially in the tech, are at the moment getting richer and richer. While and you can look at, at like what are the most wealthy companies. It's like Amazon and Google and Facebook. So a, a lot of them are in the tech business and in the innovation business. And even if you look at the like next batch of companies like pharma and. Um, uh, and, and industries like that, they as well are increasingly using artificial intelligence. Uh, so therefore, uh, those in, uh, inequality may uh, rise, uh, and especially compared to the people who are outside of the tech industry and outside of the reach of this uh, artificial intelligence jobs. Uh, now, the big question is this like Terminator uh, kind of picture and uh, everybody loves to put this on slides like will machines destroy us it is kind of unlikely especially since we are relatively far away from artificial general intelligence uh, where uh, like machines would be able to reason uh, for themselves and uh, kind of think about risks that people can uh, turn them off so therefore they will fight uh, back and uh, try to destroy humans because they pose, pose threat to us or there are other scenarios where uh, machines are programmed to uh, to, to make uh, life uh, less suffering for humans H however if they realize uh, wrongly that life as such can be a suffering then uh, by killing people uh, they may reduce suffering uh, which is kind of like logical from some like very logic driven machine driven uh, standpoint but may not be uh, uh, very intuitive for humans uh, so uh, we are first of all very far away from that then there are a lot, lot of uh, companies that are investing into ethics and AI safety uh, so once we reach that point we will be able to think about how we can uh, uh, make sure that machine don't do something like that and as well at the moment and for next quite long time probably we will have uh, machines that will be able to help us with a certain tasks and even with certain uh, kind of like relatively general tasks uh, but they would not they would be doing uh, what they are programmed to they, they will be solving certain tasks and they wouldn't be able to think uh, for themselves so uh, like this risk exists, but uh, it is very unlikely at uh, this point, and especially um, we are far away from understanding how consciousness works. And uh, since we don't understand it, we can't implement it in machines, and therefore we are uh, like it is very unlikely that. Uh, something too bad will happen to us uh, however what, what we will have and uh, what we have already is AI as a tool for either entertainment so there's a lot of recommendation engines uh, there are even like ma machines that are editing the movies making the music uh, painting and stuff like that there is a lot of help in productivity knowledge gathering knowledge sharing uh, knowledge creation uh, information sharing reasoning and accessibility so you have this man that had uh, amputated arms for whatever reason however he can use his robotic arms so like they are connected to some like nerve endings and he can actually control the his arm uh, using the new technologies and in the finance as well there are a lot like ever increasing uh, usage of AI uh, and the main feature of the financial analysis is basically analyzing a company so like 
financial data, fundamental uh, data, news, uh, and, and th those data are usually publicly available. So uh, machines proved in other domains that they can read and infer from data. Uh, and as well, the machines are quite better than humans in analyzing numbers and crunching numbers. So they, they do it much faster. Like we can't do mental math or even on the calculators as fast as machines can do. And machines can do quite complex operation very fast. Uh, so we are no match. So like we're better off uh, using it as a tool for machines crunching the numbers, making the models, and then uh, give us prediction on which we can act. Uh, and machines are very good in finding patterns. Uh, so uh, there we can as well utilize them to give us uh, the, the, to recognize the patterns. So therefore we can utilize them in future actions and investments. And there are machine learning algorithms that can be uh, adapted and are adapted already in finance industry. And that's it for this lecture. I'd like to thank you all and uh, hope to see you in some other lecture or course.